Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out uh, this morning to, uh, to this second day uh, of this conference. Uh, now, today we are very privileged to uh, have speaking to us first up, uh, Mr. Andrew Small. Um, more on him a little bit later, but for those of you who don't know me, hi there. Uh, my name is Matt Sussex and I'm the Academic Director here at the National Security College. Uh, it was going to be Rory Medcalf this morning, but uh, he's been otherwise uh, detained, so uh, I am swinging in in his present in in his stead, uh, and doubtless going to do not nearly as uh, suave a job. Um, but uh, the rules of engagement were uh, pretty much as yesterday. That uh, we'll ask Andrew to speak for about 30, 35 minutes or so, uh, and uh, then David Brewster will offer his, uh, his thoughts on Andrew's paper uh, and on, on the theme more generally for about 10 minutes, leaving plenty of time for question, answer and, uh, and discussion. Uh, so without any further ado, let me uh, introduce Andrew Small to you. Uh, he should be familiar to most people who have uh, any uh, desire to learn about uh, China and counterterrorism issues. Um, not only did he set up the German Marshall Funds Asia program, but uh, he is a, a senior transatlantic fellow uh, with them. And of course, his uh, research focuses on uh, Sino-American relations, Europe-China, uh, China and South Asia, uh, and broader themes about uh, China's foreign security policy and economic policy as well. Uh, previously, he's worked as the director of the Foreign Policy Center's Beijing office. He's been a visiting fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Um, he has worked in the office of Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, and uh, his many, many publications have uh, appeared in a number of highly reputable sources, including the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, uh, and the Washington Quarterly. Uh, and you'll probably know him uh, best for his book, uh, The China-Pakistan Axis, Asia's New Geopolitics. Uh, so I think he's eminently qualified uh, to talk to us on the topic of uh, terrorism and counterterrorism in China. Uh, and I'll ask him to offer his thoughts for, uh, for about half an hour or so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. And um, thanks to... Um, are we getting... Do we need this one? Great. Uh, thanks to Michael, too, for um, putting this entire uh, conference together. I think people often say it's a very timely event for whatever it is, but I really do think this is a very timely um, event on this topic. I think there's a lot of important um, questions um, across all of the regions that we'll be talking about um, today. Um, and in the context that I'm going to be talking, um, although I will f the paper itself is focused on um, South and Southwest Asia and much of what I will cover uh, involves some of the specifics of developments there. Um, I've also tried to look at a broader question, which is um, how far was Chinese counterterrorism policy in general shaped by its particular regional conditions um, in South Asia? And therefore, how far do the shifts that are taking place um, in that region um, and the enlargement of the threat beyond that region affect some of the basic principles that have guided uh, Chinese um, foreign, uh, some of the basic principles that have underpinned an important element of Chinese foreign policy, its counterterrorism policy, um, for the last 20 years or so. Um, and the basic argument I'll be running is as, as follows. Um, for the better part of uh, two decades, um, Pakistan and Afghanistan have provided the main focal points for the... Is, am I all right? We're just turning off the room. Sorry, I'll just clip this back on. Um, for, the best, for the better part of two decades, Pakistan and Afghanistan have provided the main focal points for uh, the overseas terrorist threat facing China. Um, ETIM um, did have a network of camps in Taliban-run uh, Afghanistan, and after the US invasion, um, uh, Pakistan's um, uh, FATA, the federally administered tribal areas, um, provided the base for ETIM's uh, remnants, which subsequently emerged as the Dakistan uh, Islamic Party. Their operating environment, um, ETM and TIP um, operating environment, was very heavily conditioned by the central role that Pakistan played in the region's terror map. Um, its sponsorship of the Taliban um, and other militants gave it a unique capacity to influence uh, how these groups behave towards China, um, whether through dissuading them from supporting ETIM, TIP, uh, deterring them from targeting China themselves, um, or through direct operations on Pakistani soil against ETIM um, and TIP and its partners. 
despite some tensions over China and Pakistan in recent years, um, in practice, this resulted in a highly constrained environment for TIP. Um, while they were able to generate propaganda materials, their capacity to launch attacks uh, in China or on Chinese targets was extremely limited. Uh, pretty small in number and dependent on larger, more capable groups such as the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, um, they had very little autonomous space in which to act. Uh, these conditions have now shifted in a few uh, important respects. Uh, Pakistani army Zabai Azab operation um, in North Waziristan uh, appears to have displaced the TIP from Fatah, meaning that after 15 years in Pakistan, the group's leadership is now centered in Afghanistan again. The IMU, which previously acted as the TIP's host, um, has been decimated by the Taliban following its declaration of loyalty to ISIS to such a degree that some analysts now question um, whether the group uh, meaningfully exists at all. There may be some uh, kind of small uh, 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 faction of the group that's, that's still there. Um, the principal theater for the TIP has also shifted. Um, while the group's Emir Abdul Haq, who was previously believed to have been killed in a US drone strike in 2010, um, appears to be in Afghanistan, um, the largest number of TIP fighters um, are now located in Syria, operating with Jabhat al-Nusra. The broader strategic context in which China's counterterrorism policy is operating uh, has seen important changes too. The rise of ISIS introduced a major new actor to the network of global militancy, one that has had fewer qualms than Al-Qaeda historically exhibited um, about making China an explicit target. Although more Uyghurs are fighting with Jabhat al-Nusra um, than with ISIS, uh, the group's reach poses a different set of problems for Chinese security, um, exemplified by the fact that it has attracted, um, as we uh, discussed uh, briefly yesterday, a small number of non-Uyghur Chinese recruits. Uh, the Syria conflict has also reconditioned the pathway to Uyghur militant recruitment. Um, with improvements in security um, on China's borders with South and Central Asia, the main transit routes to Syria for Uyghurs have generally been through Southeast Asia and Turkey uh, with Turkish government acquiescence. Taken together, I think these changes um, amount to perhaps the most significant set of shifts um, in China's external terrorist threat um, since 9-11. Um, the net effect of them is that after many years in which uh, China was able to mediate major elements of its counterterrorism policy uh, through its closest security partner, um, Pakistan. Uh, Beijing is finally being required to take on a more direct role um, in addressing the threat across virtually all dimensions of policy, um, politically, economically, um, and potentially even militarily. Um, I'm going to look at this across three phases, um, which partly correspond to uh, the, 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 the phases and periods that, that Sean outlined yesterday. The first phase is one that runs through the late uh, 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, and I'll kind of begin with a few of the principles that I, I think um, underpin Chinese policy across this period. Some of them are stated, uh, but a number of them are, are really unstated principles but um, that, that, that obtain across this entire stretch of time. Uh, first, that China should make sure that it doesn't become a top tier target for any of the principal um, uh, groups operating in the region. Um, whether outright terrorist organizations, militant groups, um, or their sympathizers and supporters, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Kashmiri groups, and so on. Uh, that China can and should reach deals with some of these groups over Xinjiang and over their backing to any of the groups that do target China, um, ETIM, TIP. Uh, that China, well, ETIM in that period, um, China should not take direct action itself um, against any of these broader groups and should be careful about its positioning and cooperation uh, with anyone that does. Um, Counterterrorism policy um, should and, and was almost entirely about the Uyghurs specifically. Uh, the message to most of the other groups was, um, again, in some cases directly, in some cases implicitly, um, we don't have to be enemies as long as you leave us alone uh, yourselves um, and that you don't back our enemies. Uh, for the most part, this um, set of principles worked. Um, a deal was reached with the Taliban over the status of ETIM um, and attacks from Afghan ter territory. Um, uh, Osama bin Laden made uh, very conciliatory sounding statements about um, uh, China um, in this uh, period of time. And ETIM operates under extremely restricted conditions um, throughout, this, um, throughout this stretch. Uh, there are various reasons for this. Um, local and global priorities for a number of these groups do not include China anyway. The Uyghur cause is relatively peripheral for them and so on. Um, but the other element in all of this I, I think that is important is Pakistan. Um, across this whole period of time, uh, the state that is at the center of the web of so many of the region's militant networks um, consistently sought to ensure that its all-weather friend um, didn't become a priority target um, for them. Um, it used its influence to broker relationships, 
to dissuade these groups from concerning themselves with China um, and to take direct action where necessary, including killing the leader of ETIM, Hassan Massoum, um, in South Waziristan in 2003. Um, I won't go into the uh, historical dimensions of the China-Pakistan um, relationship and the close military and intelligence ties and why um, Pakistan is, 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 is doing this, but um, uh, suffice to say that um, uh, this uh, Pakistan functions essentially as China's closest security and intelligence partner, and not just in, in, in the region, but, but more broadly, and, um, and, and this is a form of cooperation that had been there um, for a very long time. Um, so weakened is ETIM during the latter half of this period um, that at precisely the moment that China is winning its designations at the UN and from the US, um, you get very serious questions about whether the group um, really exists anymore at all. Um, and the corollary of all this is very limited cooperation on counterterrorism. Um, uh, issues with, with other powers. Um, China's willing, particularly in the 9-11 aftermath, uh, to work on issues ranging from um, sanctions, terrorist financing, monitoring of shipping containers, a few important and concrete areas. Um, but it's unwilling to assume visible involvement um, in any broader counterterrorism coalitions. It's reluctant to take on a very direct counterterrorism role um, itself, and it's averse to being tainted by association with the US and other Western powers. And you see this most obviously playing out uh, through much of this period in Afghanistan. The second phase runs from the mid-2000s to uh, a couple of years ago, um, essentially a period in which this previous framework comes under pressure, um, particularly following the establishment of the Pakistani Taliban in 2007 um, and the general tensions around the Pakistani government's cooperation with the United States in Afghanistan um, and the resulting diminution of, of Pakistan's capacity to deliver some of these outcomes um, for China. Uh, and this translates uh, in, in, in a few very concrete ways. Uh, Pakistani Taliban target China specifically, partly as a means of putting pressure on the Pakistani government, and um, partly because of their specific hostility to China um, after its involvement in the assault on the Red Mosque in 2007, in which China seemed to have had a heavy hand. Um, Al-Qaeda do make their first explicitly hostile references to, to China, um, and notably after the July the 5th events um, in Urumqi in 2009. Uh, TIP emerges in this stretch. Um, I agree very much with the analysis that says that it largely performed a propaganda function through this period of time, um, and even the Chinese government uh, dismisses some of the incidents for which it claims responsibility. Uh, the numbers in the group seem to be very small. Uh, it's in a very restricted location in North Waziristan. Um, but none of these factors um, stop China, of course, from, from, from taking um, the potential uh, threat very seriously. Um, yet the Pakistani army doesn't do and won't do very much about it directly. Um, they won't take military action in North Waziristan um, themselves out of fear of blowback, and even their friends, such as the Haqqani Network, um, uh, whose territory um, the group is in for at least a stretch, uh, won't help. And so they resort um, at points, Pakistani government resorts at, at some points, to providing targeting windows for U.S. drone strikes that they'd previously, targeting windows that they'd previously been unwilling to make available to, to, to the U.S. government in an effort to, to wipe out the TIP leadership that way. Um, this does result in, in some tensions between China and Pakistan um, over the continued presence of, of TIP um, on its soil um, and the appearance of a kind of a question mark about the degree of reliance that China has had um, on Pakistan for its intelligence and for cooperation on counterterrorism issues um, in the region. Um, uh, which which it goes into both questions of the Pakistani government's um, intentions and its, its capabilities. Um, but, um, the most recent phase then runs from early 2014. Um, first of all, the Pakistani uh, army's campaign in North Waziristan, uh, Zabai Azab, um, about which people were initially um, relatively dismissive, um, has been quite consequential in a few respects, at least for China. Um, as it became clear that the operation was going to be launched, um, a number of TIP members were among the group that were sent um, over to Syria. Um, the leadership itself appeared to re relocate to um, Afghanistan, um, including Abdul Haq, who then re-emerges after, um, uh, after being presumed dead. Um, and the campaign effectively, um, particularly after the phase of the uh, operation that goes into the Shawal Valley, um, effectively eliminates what had previously been the TIP's um, base in Pakistan. Um, second, the shift in focus to Syria sees the TIP emerging as a larger and more capable entity than it ever was in Afghanistan or Pakistan, um, whether that's in terms of combat experience, uh, facility with sophisticated weapons, its networks, um, and so on. Um, propaganda material from Syria is far more serious than the sort of stuff that was coming out from, uh, from North Waziristan. Um, 
Third, the establishment rise of, of ISIS um, introduces a, a, a new kind of problem for China to deal with. Uh, more explicit about Xinjiang, where groups in South Asia had, had often been very mealy-mouthed, uh, recruitment efforts taking place um, in Uyghur and in Mandarin, uh, and some success in ac actually attracting recruits, even if it falls far below uh, the TIP numbers fighting with uh, the Al Nusra Front in Latakia, um, and the killing of Fan Jinghui, um, uh, whom the Chinese government had been negotiating um, to uh, release, uh, obviously um, had, had an impact on uh, Chinese public opinion, at least. Um, and fourth, as I kind of mentioned in the introduction, the group that had in many respects functioned as the TIP's host um, since uh, the turn of the millennium, the IMU, um, is destroyed by the Taliban after it declares affiliation to ISIS, which the TIP leadership tried to persuade them um, not to do um, unsuccessfully. Um, this means that uh, in a certain sense, and this is still all very provisional, um, the TIP uh, could be seen to have acquired the status as the main central Asian um, uh, AQ affiliate rather than a kind of subsidiary. Um, what does this add up to for, uh, for China? Um, it's a terrorist threat that I think is now much wider in geographical scope um, with more diffuse locations in Southeast Asia and the Middle East in play, as well as South Asia, um, and much more difficult partners to deal with um, in the process, uh, notably uh, Turkey. Um, fewer of these groups are amenable to the sort of general deal making that was possible with the, the Taliban at the turn of the millennium, uh, whether that's uh, ISIS, uh, AQ in its current phase, the TTP, um, some other groups. Um, and China, although it's still not a top tier target for, um, for any of these groups, um, is not a bottom tier target um, either. Uh, there's more of a normalization of hitting Chinese targets than there used to be, uh, including economic targets. Um, and there's far greater normalization of China as a focus for, uh, for recruitment efforts um, uh, than there was um, in the previous phases. Um, now, this doesn't completely unravel the principles that uh, underpinned China's counterterrorism policy in the past, but it does make some of them harder to sustain, um, and it has necessitated a few uh, behavioral shifts. Um, in South Asia itself, um, it has uh, meant being uh, a bit less Pakistan-centric. Um, while Pakistan still occupies a critical role for Chinese policy in the region, uh, TIP's location in Afghanistan um, uh, and some other developments in Afghanistan um, have pushed Beijing towards closer direct military and intelligence cooperation with the, uh, with the Afghan government. Um, this has been in motion for a number of years, particularly following uh, Zhou Yong Kong's landmark visit to Kabul in, in 2012, uh, followed by uh, State Councillor Guo Sheng Kun and uh, Qi Jian Guo, the PLA Deputy Chief of General Staff. Um, in 2014, um, the efforts by the Afghan government to establish their standing as uh, an alternative security partner for, for China in the region uh, go back even further. But I think you've really seen that intensify in the last uh, year um, with the visit from the PLA uh, chief of general staff um, and uh, CNC member uh, Fang Fenghui in March 2016, followed by the first um, uh, kind of proper scale package of Chinese military aid. There had been some smaller things they'd given before. Um, but the biggest shift is, is not just the question of the new partners uh, in the region that China is working with. Um, I think there is also the, the, the broader issue of China taking on a more direct role um, itself, um, and taking on a role not just in addressing some of the narrow concerns about Uyghur militancy uh, in the way that it had in the past, um, but some of the broader conditions in which these groups um, operate. Again, Afghanistan, um, I think, probably uh, provides the best illustration of that, um, where China's been focused on ensuring that the country doesn't become a safe uh, haven for Uyghur militants after the US drawdown. Um, uh, following about a decade of avoiding virtually any political involvement at all um, uh, in Afghanistan, Beijing's willingness to take a leading role in the negotiations over Afghanistan's future um, had seen it in, in recent years pushing forward reconciliation process with the Taliban, convening an array of bilateral, uh, trilateral, multilateral um, groupings, and exerting influence over Pakistan to try to deliver Taliban representatives for, for the talks. Um, while these have evidently not come to fruition, and the process has been notable for China's unusual willingness uh, to take responsibility for facilitating the process and for its close and open coordination with the United States um, after years of refusing to collaborate bilaterally on any Afghan initiatives. Um, the deployment of Chinese economic instruments in the region has also been portrayed uh, more explicitly than it was in the past as a long-term means of addressing the terrorist threat. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative itself 
It has partly been framed as a way to provide stability through development across an arc of instability from, from Xinjiang to the Middle East. Um, and at least in, in, in private, Chinese leaders have been uh, quite explicit in describing some of the specific plans in these terms. Uh, my favorite is still uh, Li Keqiang in his meeting with uh, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, um, characterizing the China-Pakistan economic corridor um, as a means of weaning the populace from fundamentalism. Um, uh, it's also intended to function as a large-scale incentive for uh, various actors in the region to prioritize economic and financial rewards um, over security competition um, and some of the economic rewards that, that, that accrue from war. And you can ask questions about the efficacy of this, how many of the resources will come through for CPEC and some of these other plans, and so on. Um, but I think the deployment of Chinese economic commitments for strategic ends um, is really one of the biggest change factors um, in, in, in the region, including even, um, starting, including even on some of the security questions. Um, and in a more tentative fashion, there have also been debates in China about whether to take on uh, a more direct military role in counterterrorism efforts. Um, with the anti-terrorism law that uh, discussed yesterday, including provision for the deployment of Chinese security forces um, overseas. Um, and I have been struck by the degree to which some of the internal debates um, in China about intervention of this sort of focused on uh, Syria. Um, and the conclusion of these debates have, has obviously been against intervention, um, and the terms of the debate, um, as far as I could glean, appear to have been as much concerned with the broader value of these missions for the PLA rather than their specific utility vis-a-vis -vis counterterrorism goals. Notably, they were focused on um, ISIS rather than um, the Nusra Front, where actually the, the, the largest number um, of um, uh, Uyghur militants is fighting. Um, nonetheless, I think that even the possibility of serious military missions of this nature uh, was, was not even being seriously entertained um, a couple of years ago. Um, now to, to sort of wrap up, um, I don't want to do the uh, delusional thing of getting to the end of this and then saying that this opens up new opportunities for cooperation, um, when actually a lot of the obstacles to uh, that cooperation have not gone away, and for various countries, strategic tensions with China are rising. But um, I think cooperation with China on counterterrorism in a foreign policy context um, uh, was not just difficult because of the terrorism definition problem that we talked about um, uh, and all the double standards debates and things. Um, it was difficult because China did have a framework in place uh, that was delivering relatively successfully um, and that I think was perceived to be potentially undermined by cooperating too closely with other Western powers. Um, that framework isn't working uh, successfully anymore. China is having to operate in more regions where its partners are uh, inadequate or actively problematic, um, and where its own intelligence capabilities aren't always as well developed. Um, the very narrow, purely Uyghur-centric approach, um, I think, has also been recognized as uh, inadequate, and there's more of a move um, to think about broad-based conditions um, in which some of these groups can operate. Um, and China is now bringing more tools and resources to uh, deploy to uh, address some of these problems. Um, Afghanistan, uh, again, which is partly the focus of this, but I think partly exemplifies um, all of these trends, is already a context in which some of this broader base cooperation um, is already underway. Um, and uh, despite the tensions that exist um, elsewhere in the relationship with China, um, this is an area, uh, cooperation on Afghanistan and certain strands of counterterrorism, has been pretty well firewalled um, uh, and, and protected against some of those developments, um, uh, uh, strategic competition in the South China Sea and all of these things, um, which suggests that it may be possible um, elsewhere too. Um, I think the next session, uh, talking about the Middle East, um, will touch on the area of where I think some of that more expanded form of comp uh, cooperation is most likely. Um, so on South Asia, I will wrap it up there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, and now I will invite David Brewster to offer his, uh, his thoughts on Andrew's paper. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, or, as always, you've given a great uh, comprehensive and insightful uh, presentation on developments in this field, particularly on the evolution of Uyghur uh, militancy outside of China. And my list of some of Andrew's uh, key points uh, is, is that essentially um, terrorist or separatist groups are threatening China from outside of uh, Chinese territories have shifted their base of operations from Pakistan and Afghanistan to Syria. And this has several consequences, uh, one of which is a, a reduced ability of Beijing to control these groups or respond to these groups 
uh, via um, allies such as Pakistan. The impact of uh, Uyghur militants uh, now joining ISIS, uh, which has uh, 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 less qualms uh, than the uh, previous arrangements in terms of directly targeting China, and also the consequences uh, in, in various directions of the transfer of the physical location of uh, Uyghur militancy from being centred on Pakistan, Afghanistan to uh, Syria. Uh, Andrew also commented on uh, Chinese perspectives on uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor and in particular uh, as uh, the, um, the impact of that uh, initiative as an anti-extremist strategy and uh, essentially that the uh, economic development of Pakistan facilit facilitated by Chinese infrastructure uh, developments will wean the populace uh, from fundamentalism. I love that quote. So uh, rather than uh, focusing on uh, the impact of the movement of existing fundamentalist groups from uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan to Syria, I would uh, like to focus on this last aspect of uh, Andrew's analysis and perhaps press him uh, for his views on the consequences of the CPEC project in Pakistan for the possible rise of a whole new type of fundamentalist reaction uh, against China and indeed on uh, the whole nature of the Pakistan-China relationship. Are we uh, percent, potentially are we going to see a whole new front of, um, of terrorism against China uh, arising from uh, this initiative? <laughs> now, in, in uh, looking in, at and researching the One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, I've talked to many Chinese interlocutors about their views of why they believe that uh, China will be successful in building uh, infrastructure such as roads and railways, pipelines, etc., uh, across thousands of kilometres of some of the most dangerous territories in the world through Pakistan occupied Kashmir, tribal territories, Baluchistan, etc. Um, now, even if we uh, put uh, aside the uh, $46 billion pipe, um, uh, uh, price tag as uh, rather aspirational, as I think Andrew's book. Uh, demonstrated quite well. If past, pro past Chinese projects in the region are any indication, uh, these new projects will likely involve uh, many thousands of Chinese engineers and workers being based in the Pakistan countryside. Um, and in addition, obviously, to the establishment of many billions of dollars worth of Chinese-owned assets uh, in, in these parts. Uh, it seems to me that the level of involvement of China in Pakistan that this initiative uh, implies creates a whole new recipe for China in the region. Uh, but Chinese perspectives uh, about this is quite revealing. There seems to be a strong belief uh, that in general that Chinese promoted economic development will be an antidote to fundamentalism. Uh, and in particular, that uh, these developments will uh, make uh, Chinese people popular among local populations and thereby shield them from fundamentalist reactions. I'm not sure whether these views reflect, somehow reflect uh, a uh, ma economic materialist uh, ideology that could be traced, to, is somehow linked to communist ideology or whether it in fact reflects elements of hubris uh, uh, arising from China's recent economic successes. Um, whether, uh, and in particular, the, uh, a view that the uh, Chinese economic development model can be easily translated to other countries in the region. Uh, however, uh, I think that these sorts of views 
uh, a, a quite analogous to uh, the optimistic views of the world that would be displayed, say, by uh, a, an American engineer in 1955 as they embarked uh, on various projects in Southeast Asia um, that they were building new things for people who wanted it and they would receive uh, the, uh, the local people's gratitude for, for this. Um, uh, I wonder whether uh, China has an exceptionalist view of itself uh, that might in some way be analogous to, to that. Uh, as you know, the Pakistan army is mobilising a significant force. I think the numbers are 12,000 personnel or so that will be devoted to protecting Chinese workers and assets in Pakistan. Uh, but I do wonder how effective they will be in being able to protect many thousands of Chinese nationals in the countryside and infrastructure spread over many thousands of kilometres. Uh, one would have thought that the presence of so many Chinese nationals in Pakistan will naturally breed resentments and uh, one would have thought that the temptation, there would be strong temptations uh, among fundamentalist groups to attack Chinese nationals and assets, uh, if nothing else as a way of gaining Islamabad's attention. Uh, I also wonder how much patience Beijing would be willing to, uh, to show in allowing Pakistan to uh, have full responsibility for the protection of CPEC uh, and Chinese nationals if terrorist incidents do start to occur. Uh, as Andrew documented in his book uh, uh, about the, the Red Mosque incident in 2007, the Chinese authorities take these incidents very seriously and in fact have very little patience uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Pakistan reactions. So if Pakistan authorities aren't able to provide adequate protection, what is the, uh, the possibility or likelihood that Chinese authorities may want to provide direct security for their people and assets? Uh, and we've already seen reports that uh, Chinese security uh, forces were at some stage deployed into Pakistan-occupied Kashmir to protect Chinese workers uh, building uh, roads and other infrastructure there. So while not trying to be too pessimistic about this, certainly in my view, the elements are all there for the development of a whole new front in terms of uh, anti-Chinese extremism, or at least terrorism, or, or uh, uh, militants that target Chinese nationals and assets outside of China. And these include, uh, to my mind, the presence of large numbers of Chinese nationals in Pakistan, if uh, to the extent the CPEC project goes ahead. Uh, the likelihood that many of these projects will be undertaken without significant regard to local sensitivities. Uh, a high uh, degree of vulnerability of these assets and people to attack and the limited ability of Pakistan authorities to provide protection and the potential, uh, if it all goes sour, for Chinese security forces to become uh, directly involved in the situation. And last but not least is uh, the willingness of Beijing to become more involved in Pakistan domestic politics uh, to support the CPEC project and whether this is from a desire to uh, make the project or the decision making around the project more efficient or just a perceived need to uh, involve uh, China more directly in, in politics, whether it be politics at a national level or at a local level. Um, this, this involves a significant or would involve a significant sea change in China's 
relationships with many of these countries. We've already seen this or the beginnings of this uh, from recent reports that Beijing was pressing uh, Pakistan to have the Pakistan army uh, take control of the CPEC. Uh, and uh, you know, for what, whatever reasons you can attribute uh, uh, to, to that, involves a significant change in the relationship and that's, that would, uh, in my view, result in a significant change in the views of uh, Pakistani militants towards the CPEC project and towards China. Um, we've already, uh, and this isn't just only relating to Pakistan, we've also seen signs of this movement in uh, Myanmar, where in connection with the Trans-Myanmar uh, uh, project, uh, um, uh, e economic corridor ending at Kaukpyu, uh, China has become more involved in domestic politics in Myanmar, including in domestic politics in Rakhine State, uh, where uh, there's the uh, Rohingya population resides and there is a significant potential for um, violence. Um, now, as I said, uh, to, to my mind, this potentially reflects a sea change in China's involvement in local politics in neighbouring states and I wonder whether uh, this could be a new dimension of uh, terrorism against China. Well, thanks very much, David. Uh, <clears throat> one of the signs of a good discussant is their ability to uh, to raise lots of uh, topics for, for everybody else to pick on. And uh, sitting there, I uh, came up with a, a number, hubris, exceptionalism, the willingness of China to get involved uh, in uh, in local politics, and, uh, and also, I suppose, questions over whether we see China as a mid-range or a top-tier target uh, for future terrorist attacks. Another thing I think that struck me uh, was, was about the economic dimension of some of the confidence building measures that China sees itself putting in place through One Belt, One Road. Uh, it's interesting, I think, that uh, the view is that you provide development opportunities initially through the construction of an economic trade corridor, and that might well bring decent benefits in terms of soft power uh, effects for, uh, for the People's Republic of China. However, I suppose the question is, uh, once it is completed, if it is completed, how does one ensure that those benefits are sustained and ongoing so that local residents, for instance, don't just see the caravan passing on through the region without, uh, without any sort of sustained benefits for themselves? Uh, but that's just something I was thinking about. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'm sure people have lots of questions. Uh, can we just ask you to state your name and affiliation, if you have one, uh, and keep your questions relatively brief, if possible, um, so that we have plenty of time for everyone to take part. Who's going to kick us off? Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Adam from University of Adelaide. Um, how do you understand China's um, new passport policy towards Uyghurs? Um, it was extremely uh, difficult uh, uh, years ago, like it took me 10, 10 years to get my passport. Um, now it's available to general public, even to farmers. And generally Uyghurs travel to Turkey with, the, with their uh, passports these days. Is there any links between the new passport policy uh, with losing the China, South China um, border control and let some Uyghurs cross the border? In both ways, whether legally or illegally, Uyghurs end up being in Turkey. Um, some of them, of course, are continue to continue their journey into Syria, whether they um, join Islamic State or Al Nusra Front. My question is: Do you believe or think that there was a Chinese involvement or a political agenda to label Uyghurs as terrorists, or Uyghurs being? Uyghurs are just super intelligent and found way out to leave China. Thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and answer a, 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 a slice of that. Um, uh, maybe not um, all of it, um, particularly on the, the specifics of, of the passport. Um, 
uh, policy. Um, uh, I mean, evidently, there is a combination of the politi a political agenda in, in, in the labeling, um, but also something that is, uh, that, that is a genuine threat. I mean, I, I obviously focused on the latter dimension in, in, in the presentation. Um, the, I mean, one of the questions that um, I, I think is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is in a new one that I, I'm still trying to figure out answers to is how this recruitment process is working through these uh, uh, th uh, in, in the context of, of, of these new uh, transit routes um, where, where previously um, uh, there was uh, th th there were obviously people uh, trying to uh, leave uh, China and go to Turkey for, for other purposes. And the degree to which the Turkish government is um, actively funneling um, people into the conflict, um, how far this is taking place um, at their behest, whether this, um, uh, how 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 much intentionality there is in this, how recruits are being identified, and um, how some of the how the distribution is moving between people that are basically being sent into these former Alawite villages in in, in northern Syria through that phase, um, the, the much more limited numbers of people um, who are being targeted by um, uh, ISIS. Um, I, I, I think that what, what has been, I think we, we talked about it yesterday, um, an exodus that is evidently uh, taking place as a result of particularly the post-2009 um, uh, crackdown um, and then the much more uh, efficacious uh, border controls in central uh, Asia and South Asia than existed in the past, um, I think is just posing a very different set um, uh, of, of questions about the transitions from uh, 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 people who in a number of cases, and this was the same evidently in Afghanistan and Pakistan, had no real intention of leaving China to go and join militant groups, um, but were simply being funneled into them by the networks that were enabling their um, uh, uh, their exit from China, um, uh, or for financial reasons, when they found themselves in um, in, in in the new destination um, uh, countries. Thank you very much um, for a very interesting presentation. I have a cluster of questions, which I will keep brief, and I apologize in advance. Um, the first is a sort of uh, a question about Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan has you know, been a problem uh, for terrorism for a long time for a lot of different countries, and I think a lot of other countries have found themselves very frustrated by the degree to which Pakistan is manipulating the problem to have some sort of bigger relationship with uh, whichever country it is, be it the United States, be it uh, European countries. And so a lot of countries tend to look at Pakistan as a fairly unreliable actor within this regard. Have you seen any evidence of China having that particular concern when we're looking at CT questions, or is it very much a sort of reliable partner that they feel that they're dealing with? And then sort of ancillary to that, you know, how much do you think, because I think there's an interesting dynamic that's evolving around Turkey's relationship with the conflict in Syria, um, and I think you could draw some parallels with what we're seeing, what we saw historically with Pakistan and the conflict in Afghanistan. Are there any lessons you think specifically for China about how they have managed that relationship with Pakistan that you think they could use in a Turkish context? Um, which are you curious about? And then the, the final question is um, looking at the Pakistan Middle East relationship, uh, which is very interesting because Pakistan, of course, is a country that has relationships with Iran and with uh, Gulf countries, quite strong ones. Um, do you think that's a possible way? for China to leverage its relationship with Pakistan to try to uh, achieve ends or, or worry about CT concerns in uh, Middle Eastern countries? Thank you. Sure. Um, so on the first one, yes. I uh, have other points at which there have been questions about Pakistan's uh, reliability um, on these issues. Um, yes, I think there were, there were particularly serious questions when these lists were being released and Pakistan was not uh, taking effective action against any of the members of the, the the group for a period of time, and so there was a question that was there about whether this was, um, as was being said by Kayani and others, because they didn't want the, the, of the risks of taking action um, in North Waziristan, um, uh, or was this was this because there were some people in the Pakistani army who were sympathetic uh, to these groups, and there were you would get these complaints from people about intelligence being provided, warnings being then given to groups before operations were conducted. Um, a lot of the stuff that would have sounded quite familiar to uh, to others too, but with a very different backdrop of the level of trust that I think 
is, is, is there historically in that relationship and between the Pakistani uh, army and, and, and the PLA um, than existed with, with others. So I, I think there's more of a predisposition of uh, more of an assumption of trust than, than, than there has been. But there were, I, I think, some, some, uh, some questions that, that were being raised and, and um, they were raised partly as a result of broader developments that people saw within the Pakistani um, army and religious sympathies within the Pakistani Pakistani army and this sort of thing. Um, I think Zabay Azab was in that sense also eff quite effective in allaying some of those concerns because it's taken out um, a piece in the China-Pakistan relationship that was uh, was a source of tension that I mean didn't really spill out very much in, in public. But you would talk to former army chiefs and things on the Pakistani side. I mean, you, you had very reliable accounts. Um, of some of the exchanges on, on, on these issues that were for a stretch, particularly from you know, 2007, 2008 through to uh, more recently, some, some real tensions. And I, I think um, having, no longer having TIP on Pakistani soil is a, a consequential shift and the action taken in North Syristan, um is, is consequential in, in, in at least taking uh, some of those tensions out. Um, lessons to learn for Turkey. I mean, I think the difficulty is that um, the Pakistan relationship with so many uh, distinct and unique uh, features to it and such a long uh, uh, sort of prehistory um, that it's quite difficult to replicate um, uh, uh, too many elements of that. I've been struck by some of the writing in the last year saying, though, that Pakistan is a relationship that is a model to follow um, for others, for China. Um, and in that sense, I think a model to follow in being a uh, a kind of deep security relationship that still falls short of being um, uh, a military alliance, and um, uh, still, I, I think the expectation is that that would that would change. Um, but whether there's a level of trust that's been built um, over time in military to military cooperation um, uh, that can mean that the country functions as a sort of quasi ally that can be counted on for a whole series of of, of different things. And so, whether that, uh, I think, the Turkish case uh, is it, it's so far away from being something where that's uh, realizable in uh, a time frame of years, even uh, uh, a longer time frame. That I, I think it's difficult to take direct lessons from the uh, the, the the Pakistan relationship um, uh, for for that. But I think you 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 would see it in in other uh, in other cases in terms of a um, uh, a deepened and heightened level of military cooperation that for, um, that that can then translate into various other. Um, uh, benefits, including on counterterrorism, but not necessarily centrally on counterterrorism. Um, I don't think I think um, Pakistan historically played a role um, in brokering China's relations in the Middle East. Um, I think that's uh, dropped off um, in important ways in 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 the last stretch, just as a result of the fact that China has its own direct relationships there. Um, I think there are moments when uh, China draws on Pakistan for these purposes, notably after the uh, Urumqi. Um, uh, riots in, in 2009, where Pakistan was having to do a lot of the running and make a lot of the running in the OIC and and, and places like that. But um, I think the, the bulk of the cooperation um, that on intelligence and a number of these kind of new areas that China's having to navigate in, in the region, I think, are less mediated through uh, the Pakistanis and, and more, as far as I can tell, directly with the states in, in question. And there's a fair prehistory of of um, uh, of, of of ties with a number of uh, states in, in the region that, that, that don't necessarily um, require very much Pakistani involvement. Uh, I'll just say some quick words about the uh, idea of um, China leveraging Pakistan's relationships in the region. I mean, it's obviously it's a strategy that the US followed for, for many decades with, with some successes, but overall, uh, I suppose, failure. Um, but the, the more fundamental question is, is, is to the extent that it turned Pakistan into a rent-seeking state and uh, the application of that rent-seeking behaviour to its relationship with China. So I would, uh, I think, agree that it wouldn't be a good policy or even a, or a necessary policy for China to be following. Um, I, I wanted to uh, follow up on uh, some of the things brought up by the discussion uh, regarding the Belt and Road <coughs> Initiative. Uh, Andrew, you, you wrote a, a piece recently in Foreign Policy about kind of how the changing leadership in the Taliban could create problems for China. Um, I mean, one of the things that strikes me about um, what was said about the Belt and Road Initiative is there's certainly 
could be motivations out of that to create local discontent, but of course that doesn't immediately translate into militancy or terrorism, but if Al-Qaeda was involved, it could. So I'm wondering what your analysis, since you wrote that piece, in terms of the potential for Al-Qaeda, uh, kind of the deals at one time made between China and Al-Qaeda, those breaking down and perhaps leading to uh, tension that could be translating to violence. Now China's kind of gone and had to go through two rounds of new leadership. Um, uh, on, on, on the Taliban. Um, I think um, the last one was just the post Mullah Omar uh, development. Um, uh, that, I mean, I, I think the Afghan Taliban is probably the case where at the leadership level, they've been able to maintain relatively um, effective contacts and, and, and relationships and, um, and hold certain elements of uh, the deals that they've made previously um, together with them. And um, I think there has been a real continuity um, of, of, of those ties um, at the leadership level. I think the difficulty has been that the Taliban um, have, as a whole, become um, perhaps less amenable to central leadership control and less amenable to uh, Pakistani um, control than, than, than they were, even with leaders being put in place that are um, uh, exceptionally close to uh, to the ISI and, and things, as as, um, as as was the case um, uh, after Malomar's death, um, and I think that that's part of I think, the concern that feeds in more broadly um, in uh, Afghanistan. That uh, how far do these kinds of agreements hold in light of um, uh, how the movement has evolved um, and um, uh, in light of the behaviour of various. Um, facets of, of the movement that weren't necessarily on, um, on on questions of you know do you provide some support to uh, TIP do you fight for TIP do you uh, th these sorts of things um, are not necessarily the authority that was once exercised by Maloma on those questions is not going to be exercised quite as forcibly on a on a question like that and therefore um, you you don't necessarily want to see an overly successful um, Taliban in uh, Afghanistan, you, you do want to make sure that there's some kind of um, uh, deal in place that mitigates um, at least their, uh, their role in the country, rather than trusting that these um, these, these kinds of deals will, um, will, will, will stick. Um, and I think that's, I mean, you also see the concern playing in uh, with respect to the peace talks, for instance, if, if the Pakistani army had uh, decided that in light of the Pac uh, in light of the Afghan Taliban's unwillingness to take part in, in peace talks, they should uh, crack down on, on, on the movement. For instance, um, let, let, let's say hypothetically they had been had, had been willing to do that. I think that could have led to. Uh, I, I can see why China would be sympathetic to a Pakistani view that says that this would have more problematic uh, consequences for them than it was than than, than was really worth it. Um, uh, if you did, and the Pakistani Taliban, of course, provide the. The the, the 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 sort of problem model for how that could evolve much more explicit targeting of um, of the Chinese much more explicit targeting of the Pakistani state and possibly the Chinese to get at the Pakistani state and if and and the concern that you would have a kind of more not necessarily completely unified movement but but something that looks more like uh, those groups operating in, in closer cooperation with um, uh, with each other which I think informs some of the the caution still about China's um, uh, approach to uh, uh, the Taliban, uh, you know, how heavy-handed they are with the Pakistanis on, on, on some of these um, uh, issues. I don't think any of these, uh, I mean, the Afghan Taliban certainly haven't been talking, I mean, there's been no sense of targeting uh, Chinese economic assets. Um, I think there's um, the, 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 the questions there are as much the Baluchi groups and um, uh, to to a certain extent, the Pakistani Taliban, um, and, and certainly CPAC is a, is an appealing looking uh, target. Um, uh, I think, as David was discussing little in his presentation, I think the difficulties are as much with uh, also with the broader politics in, in in Pakistan and and ensuring that you at least have a consensus between uh, the main parties. Um, uh, and some of the other forces, um, some of the other provinces, and and, and, and things, um, uh, and and again, there's a high residue of goodwill in in, in Pakistan that um, uh, that means that at the popular level, at least, China's still in in pretty good standing. So it does still come down more to some of the specific for now, and and that could change, but for now, it does come down to um, more of the kind of specific militant groups that see themselves as being problematically affected.
Yeah, uh, th thanks Andrew and also David um, for, for, for your role as discussant. I'm um, raising lots of interesting questions. Um, I've just got a sort of a wider question which I think sort of links a number of different concerns that people have raised in their questions. Um, and that is really um, the role, or are there debates in China about um, how growing involvement in a number of these key regions, so for example Pakistan we've talked, touched on CPEC, uh, also debates about intervention in Syria. Uh, and also the growing relation, direct relationship with the Afghan government. Um, is there sort of any high level debate oh, that you've seen um, uh, within China about sort of this argument that, you know, China is in some sense is in danger of replacing the United States as kind of the bete noir for various regional and glo global jihadist organisations? I mean, I, m m I think there's still a degree, I mean, if you're looking at the particular each of the cases in, in, in question, um, it's quite a delicate dance at the moment, I think, in Afghanistan. Um, there's been a real caution, I think, about extending military aid in the past to the Afghan government. Um, that was quite a statement, even if it's not hugely consequential uh, in, in, in a practical way. Um, I think the symbolism of, 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 being, uh, of, of being willing to do that was, um, was, was quite important, um, both in terms of the, what it amounts to in the direct cooperation with the Afghan government, but it was it was uh, the Feng Feng Hui's trip was, was at a very delicate juncture in the peace, whether the Taliban would participate in peace talks, and so there's been some I think some of the the signalling that there's there's been around that um, uh, has had to be quite carefully calibrated to um, both signal the Taliban that they have to take part in the peace process. There's no route to victory purely on the battlefield, et cetera, et cetera. The Kabul isn't going to be drop, abandoned um, uh, in the context of, of, um, uh, of a broader Western withdrawal, that China's going to be one of the continued partners there, um, but that um, the Taliban are also uh, um, uh, a political force that China is willing to deal with in, in, in a certain um, framework as well, and certain forms of support of historically been provided um, there too. But it, it's, it's, it's a more, it's a trickier balance to play. I mean, you had in the first phase of the peace negotiation stuff, um, there, was, there were a lot of statements coming from a lot of parties saying, you know, China's the only one, you had statements from the Taliban, China's the only country that we really trust the, in terms of their intentions and, and, and things like that. The, at a certain point in any of these processes, that unravels and, and, and um, the suspicions about the motivations and, 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 and things grow. And I think you've seen that in Afghanistan um, in the period in which China has been more actively involved. I think you will see it in Pakistan, as I think David um, suggested somewhat in the talks. Again, very high, very high base of public support, still the country in which uh, public opinion um, around China uh, you know, plus 80 percent popularity and plus 90 percent in, in certain polls. Um, but I would imagine that will come down um, as China's, the depth of China's involvement, the extent of the interactions um, becomes more broad based. And I think the intentions behind a lot of what is being done with CPEC are, are pretty benign. Um, uh, but the ramifications of, of that um, immersion for Pakistani companies that aren't happy um, about Chinese companies getting preferential terms, particular regions feeling that they're missing out, China reinforcing Punjabi dominance, all of these kinds of things, just uh, whether China likes it or not, they get sucked into. And I think the degree of infighting that you've seen over CPEC um, uh, is, is, is quite illustrative of that. And you do, I mean, the, the, there is a difficult question at the moment when it comes to, for instance, a heightened role for the military in the implementation of projects. Um, I think China was very careful after the Red Mosque incident not to repeat that degree of what looked like heavy handedness. Um, if on CPEC you were to have a situation in which you had, uh, you had optics that were that China had been part of a process of pushing the Pakistani army to uh, take on uh, uh, an enlarged role at the expense of the civilian government, um, that, would, that would start to look like uh, another actor um, uh, and um, would, uh, you know, would, what I think hit parts of public opinion that have not been, that have been very positively disposed to, to, to China for, um, for, for, for some time. Um, at the same time, I mean, on, on some of these areas, China kind of has to take on this role and there's been, a, I don't think it's always been done uh, with much enthusiasm. I think there's just been the sense that there's a real necessity to take on an additional level of involvement on, on, on these issues to be able to um, look out for Chinese interests that are on a very, very large uh, 
scale in some of these cases. I mean, that the, the economic level of involvement, uh, the salience of the issues for China's domestic security, all of these things is such that it's pretty unavoidable. Um, uh, and there's, there's how to do that most effectively. But I think the fact of their having to take on this um, uh, additional role um, in what are some quite straight domestic political uh, questions just naturally um, uh, naturally uh, presents itself. Nietzsche Bramham, um, you spoke quite a lot about China's increasing willingness to deploy their economic interests for the economic development um, in Pakistan and Afghanistan to fight fundamentalism. If China sees this as a policy that is effective in fighting fundamentalism, has there been any consideration of applying that policy domestically so say within um, Xinjiang, apologies for the pronunciation, um, within domestic regions where they do see there's a potential threat um, as a way to fight fundamentalism? Um, so I'll, I, I think um, the kind of unpack that into, into two elements. Um, one is I don't think that, I don't think that China's been particularly uh, naive about believing that um, uh, putting economic resources into Pakistan is going to magically uh, resolve the problems there. Um, I think it is uh, seen as a pretty long-term uh, process um, that is as much about um, how do you create the conditions for the Pakistani economy to function basically normally. Um, I'm, I'm sort of I'm, I tend to be more skeptical about the degree to which the kind of transit corridor stuff is a central part of it versus the degree to which, you know, energy projects and um, industrial parks and some of the kind of how do you, how do you really, how do you get the Pakistani economy growing at 7% a year rather than 4% a year? Um, and what does that do over the long term? Um, I, I think some of those questions um, uh, are, are probably uh, more important ones, even if in the interim period you may well have... Um, uh, more unrest as a result, more uh, reaction of certain sorts to an enlarged uh, Chinese role in doing some of these things. I think the, the argument would be that over a very long time frame, um, uh, ultimately an economically growing Pakistan will be, um, uh, will, will, will be um, a Pakistan that moves further away from the risks of um, instability and, uh, and extremism. But that, I, I don't think there's, a, there's a, a blinkered view that this is going to translate um, in any way uh, quickly, or that, as you suggest, uh, I mean, China's internal experiences um, in Xinjiang um, uh, don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily follow that, um, uh, say, heightened economic equality that sees more winners um, from economic growth, more losers from economic growth, more perception of inequality, doesn't necessarily uh, translate into uh, uh, less problematic responses from some of the affected groups through that um, uh, through that economic transition. Um, uh, uh, I mean, one thing I would also just finally kind of differentiate between is um, in Afghanistan, I don't think there is the willingness to put the money into um, uh, uh, to, to, or, or a belief that it is possible to put the money into uh, to, to fix the problems. I think their stability is seen as a precondition for investment, whereas in Pakistan, I think the sense is that um, uh, there's a willingness to make investments despite knowing that um, instability, that there, there is a degree of instability there. There are some of these risks. Uh, I think there's a somewhat greater appetite for uh, a greater threshold for uh, uh, for tolerating some of the likely ramifications in, in, in Pakistan, which may well involve heightened attacks and, 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 and things. Um, uh, in Afghanistan, that's, that's, that's not there. Um, uh, but just because of the situation in, in, in the two countries and because of the considerably greater strategic importance that, 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 that Pakistan plays um, uh, as, as well. Um, I'm not necessarily sure. I mean, sorry, this is partly also <laughs> responding yeah. back to a couple of David's um, initial points. Um, I'm still not necessarily sure that that translates into um, uh, China, I mean, I think you could see kind of, as you've already seen a little bit in Pakistan and Afghanistan, a bit of, you know, kind of private security, um, uh, XP, serving PLA, rotated out, working on particular projects and things. I still think that's on quite a modest scale. Um, I, I don't think it would be seen as efficacious to put real, you know, actual numbers of people in. And I still think most of the presence in uh, Kashmir, Gilgit-Baltistan, things like that are still, you know, 
Omicore of engineer type stuff rather than um, uh, kind of real PLA presence or, or, or something like that. And I would imagine that's still true. And Pakistanis have done a decent job since 2008, nine in actually protecting Chinese workers. There have been, there was the near miss in Karachi. Um, every, anyone else has been attacked in, in, in China. Um, uh, in the last period of time has not been working on a project. You had an academic, you had the mountaineers, um, but since the phase in which there were a number of successful attacks, um, the protections that have been extended by the Pakistanis have been, have been work, have worked relatively um, effectively. And although I think there's still very high levels of concern there, and that does actually go back to one of the reasons why the, there is some interest in seeing the army more hardwired in some of these projects, um, Pakistani, got, Pakistani army has done a, a, a better job than uh, it, it was doing in 2007, 2008, uh, 2000, the, even uh, into the earlier phase of attacks in, in Balochistan, um, in at least ensuring that Chinese workers themselves have not been um, hit. Whether that continues with the larger numbers, who knows, but, um, uh, but at least there's a few years of uh, precedent for suggesting that they, um, uh, uh, that you, uh, barring a broader des deterioration in the security situation in, in Pakistan, you're not as likely, I think, in the next phase to see a direct repeat of the sort of stuff that you saw in, say, 2007. I thought that was a, a very, very stimulating presentation by Andrew and, and also some, some quite interesting remarks by, uh, by our own David Brewster. I'm particularly struck by uh, you know, the willingness of the participants to move beyond the weaker dimension uh, and uh, particularly Andrew's observation that China now really does face an urgent need to broaden beyond that initial narrow scope. Now, of course, Beijing is going to resist doing so because once you change strategy, once you broaden your ambit scope in who you deal with, the types of policy responses you use when you use military force, it raises the question of, well, when does that become a self-fulfilling prophecy and how do you prevent that from happening? One of the consequences, of course, of China's upward, upward trajectory, dragging it into new uh, security dilemmas, which previously it, it hasn't needed to engage with. Uh, so I think plenty of food for thought from this session, and uh, I'd ask you to join with me in uh, thanking Andrew and David. Thank you.